But as you rightly note, there's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no, no input coming in. And there's certainly nothing going out. There's no arms or legs. It's just a little piece of tissue sitting in a Petri just dish floating in media. And yet that small speck of neurons is creating the framework that is all ready to receive information that never comes in and to implement some sort of action, which it's completely incapable of doing because it has not attached to a body. What's up everybody from Nautilus, I'm Brian Gallagher and you're watching Behind the Scenes. Today I'm speaking with Ken Kosick. Ken is a neuroscientist at UC Santa Barbara where he co-directs the Neuroscience Research Institute. His work explores fundamental biological processes related to the brain, like synaptic plasticity, and how it evolved. He completed a BA and MA in English literature from Case Western Reserve University in 1972, and an MD from the Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1976. He was previously a full professor at Harvard Medical School before moving to UC Santa Barbara in 2004 as the Harriman Professor of Neuroscience Research. His recent story in Nautilus was titled what the tiny cluster of brain cells in my lab are telling me. Ken, thanks for joining us. You bet, happy to be here. All right, so to start off, would you mind summarizing your academic background for us a little bit more? How do you go from getting a master's in English to where you are now? Uh, yes, let me uh, try to re retrace that a little bit. Um, I. Um, I have, I have always uh, been quite interested in literature. I, to this day, I could still see myself having done that, but um, it is a little tricky to make a living in that field. And uh, I was gradually uh, and increasingly intrigued by medicine and decided that um, really the, the art of medicine really needed uh, people that had uh, humanistic backgrounds. So um, I made the jump. What were some of your favorite works of literature that, that really drew you to studying it all the way to a master's? Well, I did my master's on Thomas Pynchon, um, who I still like to this day, although I'm not quite as enamored with him as I was at that time. Um, I, I think the person who I've most recently become uh, very intrigued with is um, Samuel Beckett and actually have a piece about him in uh, Nautilus and his struggle with language and words and understanding that concept of, from my perspective, trying to understand that concept uh, as a neuroscientist about how we use words, how we use words as abstractions for what may lie more deeply in the brain. I, um, I recall a literature class I took at UC Santa Barbara, that's where I went uh, for my undergraduate and we studied Beckett, and I think it, his book was called The Unnameable. That's Is the that one, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's a trilogy, that, that's the third one, yes. Right, that was, I have to say, it was kind of fairly over my head. I was a philosophy major at the time, and I thought this would be really fascinating, but I, I really struggled to grasp what the professor was trying to get across about that book. It's a bit dense, but actually, as you get more and more into it, it's really rather humorous, actually. Um, Beckett has an incredible sense of humor, and as you sort of become more immersed in this individual is uh, sort of losing his body while his mind is still going, and uh, without having this sort of corporal attachment to the world, uh, we're increasingly seeing what remains. And uh, the, it becomes a very compelling story. I, I think sometimes you have to read it a second time. Another way to get into it is to listen to it on Audible because then it gets communicated in a way that uh, uh, actually the, the text is being rendered by an actor and it it's really becomes much more accessible. Well, this was uh, a great unexpected segue into the subject of your piece because you write about your research on brain organoids and those things seem to have some simulacrum of, of real human brain activity, or at least in other animals, but there is no body, just like uh, the hero in The Enable is uh, losing his body. 
but still has yes. some brain function. Um, do you want to give our listeners and viewers a brief summary of your piece uh, if they haven't read it yet? Sure. Uh, so brain organoids are made from stem cells, from, in our case, human stem cells. And uh, they, uh, as you know, stem cells can be any cell in the body. As they differentiate, they can be made into kidney or heart cells, anything. We make them into neurons. And when you grow those neurons in a certain way, by certain, I mean you grow them in a gel-like material. So they actually start growing in three dimensions instead of on a flat planar surface. As they lift into this third dimension, they begin to assume uh, an anatomy that resembles the brain. Now it's only a few mil they're only a few millimeters, they're tiny specks, but if you slice them open and look under a microscope, uh, there is uh, an uncanny resemblance to the brain. And indeed, uh, when we look at the individual cells in these organoids, and there are about maybe half a million to a million cells there, um, there is a vast diversity of cells that also resembles the brain. What we did, and what is the subject of this piece, is to record from the organoids. By record, I mean put an electrode up against them and to listen to the signaling, the sounds, the kind of uh, fat firing that the brain, uh, the, the organoid is doing. And this firing of signals also resembles the brain. And that's really the subject of the piece because um, this resemblance I think is quite striking. So what is instigating the activity in these cells if they're not getting feedback from the environment in any normal sense? That's the perfect question. And, and, and that is actually what I think is most intriguing. That is that these brain cells uh, have the intrinsic ability to fire their what we call action potentials. And that's not surprising. We've known that neurons in isolation can do that. But when they start to grow in these organoids, all of that firing becomes organoid, uh, organized in a way that looks like it could be uh, have the potential for encoding information. But as you rightly note, there's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no, no input coming in. And there's certainly nothing going out. There's no arms or legs. It's just a little piece of tissue sitting in a Petri just dish floating in media. And yet that small speck of neurons is creating the framework that is all ready to receive information that never comes in and to implement some sort of action, which it's completely incapable of doing because it has not attached to a body. Um, but it looks like the framework is there in some sort of very rudimentary way to do all that. That is so captivating what, what that might mean. Um, what was your impetus or, or the inspiration for writing about your work on this now? Well, I think brain organoids really are a topic that uh, can be of interest to a wider audience than just neuroscientists um, who are a pretty wide audience themselves. But the fact that um, there is this in this speck of tissue floating in a dish that has some sort of intrinsic activity uh, seems to me to have um, some philosophical implications. Uh, it has uh, some medical implications in that the um, organoids might be used to evaluate drugs, to become models for diseases. So I think the technology advance of organoids has a very broad appeal and was my inspiration for trying to write something. One of my favorite lines from your story was when you say intrinsic rhythms at multiple frequencies oscillate through the brain, collide and disperse like the wake from a motorboat angling through a ocean waves. Can you unpack that statement 
for us a bit. How do rhythms and oscillations relate to what we might be thinking, doing, or feeling at any given moment? Yes. Well, so the way to think about that is that the individual neurons in, in the brain, there are about 86 a billion of them, uh, are from time to time, some of them remain silent for a long time and some of them start firing and they will fire with some degree of synchrony, depending on where they are in the brain, they start to fire together. And as the neurons begin to undertake some sort of collective action, by which I mean firing together, they, they become more than just individual elements. They start to function as a group, uh, as an assembly, as a, as, um, a way of um, conveying information that is uh, collective information. And the form, the electrophysiological form that that takes is no longer just a sharp spike, which is what we see when a, a neuron fires an action potential, it just goes up and down and it's just a blip on the screen. What we see when multiple neurons, literally say tens, hundreds of thousands of them are firing together becomes a wave, a, um, a wave that moves along at different frequencies. And those waves can come from, now I'm talking about a brain, not the organoid, uh, those waves can come from different parts of the brain and they can emerge at different frequencies. So if you think of the ocean with the waves coming in, all laying some fundamental frequency of neurons sending their waveforms all across the water. Um, and then along comes a, a boat that, as is mentioned in the piece, and cutting across those waves, it then intersects with them. And sometimes it can amplify those waves and sometimes it can negate those waves. But the complexity of multiple waves operating together from different directions really gets it how the brain is is somehow deeply related to how the brain handles input and information. It, it's, it remains a very mysterious area. It's a big topic in neuro, neuroscience. So the fact that the, uh, just to add one little add end here, the, uh, the fact that the organoid is doing some of this uh, on miniature scale is another just remarkable feature. This would not be happening with just neurons plated in a dish. Mm -hmm. You also lit up my imagination when you wrote about how an organoid augmented with algorithms that could be transmitted back to a patient of say suffering from Alzheimer's through what you say a metaverse like headset could potentially restore a lost or forgotten image and the memories and emotions associated with them. And you say this would represent a synthetic consciousness with far greater versatility than a hardwired computer chip. Is, um, is that a, a kind of pouring cold water on the, the brain machine interfaces that uh, seem to be coming out more and more often? Is it organized um, the way we should be going? Organoids have a lot to offer. I don't know that we want to pour cold water on anything, but uh, it really, uh, it does, um, I do think we have to think about organoids as contributing to this problem of a brain interface. Um, so uh, organoids have something to offer here. Now, the quote that you presented was, um, it's very much toward the end of the paper is where, you know, you sort of reach that high intellectual note that you, that a writer wants to do when they get toward the end of a piece. Uh, so admittedly, that's quite speculative and certainly does not exist at this, at this moment in time. But the idea that um, an organoid contains the uh, capacity for encoding information that these uh, sort of still unrealized algorithms are there means that perhaps uh, it can be utilized to fill in some of the missing pieces that uh, an impaired brain, let's say Alzheimer's, would not be able to do. Mm -hmm. 
so the idea there would be to somehow surgically insert organoids into places in the brain where connections are damaged or severed and the organoid could kind of act as a bridge. Is that the idea? Uh, I think uh, that might be a possibility, although I'm not, that wasn't the way I first thought about it. Uh, I think we are getting closer to the point where we can, um, with very minimal damage to the brain, put a probe right into the brain. Uh, by a probe, I mean a kind of a shank, a, 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 a long a rod that has electrodes on it and can both stimulate the brain along that shank-like structure and also record from the brain. So we don't have to necessarily um, implant the organoid. We could actually take readings from the brain that would then go out to the organoid and the organoid could send information back into the brain through this, this very tiny rod that would be minimally uh, disruptive. Remember, I just want to emphasize how speculative this is. This does not right. exist at this moment. This is very dreamy, and it's the kind of thing, though, that um, um, gets back. You mentioned about pouring cold water on this interface. So it doesn't pour cold water. It actually requires that we have uh, an interface of um, some sort of electrode that's mediating the conversation between the brain and the organoid. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so, I mean, how speculative is this sort of idea? Is it, I mean, how long do you think we are away from a biotech startup exploiting the advantages that an organoid can offer? Uh, I think we're, uh, you know, I, I, I have no crystal ball. I can't put a time frame on any of this kind of thing. Uh, organoids will be increasingly well understood. They will be, they already are being used for uh, exploration of uh, various pharmaceuticals, for drugs, for psychiatric drugs, to try to understand how they work. Um, organoids um, may soon become, uh, we, we, may, we, we are already getting some data on implanting organoids into a rodent brain human organoids. A paper recently came out to that effect. Um, so there, so the information is emerging. I think another area where uh, we'll inch closer to this speculative idea is to thread together uh, the way an organoid processes information and our current understanding of how an artificial intelligence system processes information. Really, the brain operates in a way that's very, very different from uh, machine learning. So as all of these fields march together, move forward, we may at some point, and, you know, in a, maybe a decade from now, begin to, uh, to think about some of the ideas that I'm, you know, talk about at the very end of the paper. Um, how close do you think researchers are to trying to design machine learning systems or, or algorithms to mimic or replicate the way that a young human grows and develops and learns because it's always a, a common refrain that humans can learn really complex useful things with very little data, very little experience, whereas the amount of training that machine learning algorithms have to go through is massive. Right. Well, we we have to um, think about that trope a little bit more, perhaps, because um, when we try to uh, teach an AI system to learn to recognize an apple and have to show them a gazillion things before it can be successful. Um, and uh, a child learns it on the, the first the first look. Uh, you have to also factor into that that by the time the child is recognizing an apple, um, the child has already been is uh, like a year, two, three, four, five years old. So it has uh, years of experience with the real world and really 
um, knows a lot about dimensionality, about foreground and background, about shadows, about looking at things in profile or head on. These are all things that an AI system has to learn from scratch over and over and over again. And many of the times when AI systems make a mistake is because they that's what they mess up on, on stuff that's just obvious to a two-year-old. And um, so even a very young child comes prepared to the problem of recognition, of you know, visual identification, category, category identification, um, with a lot of information behind behind this this kit, and um, but you're right, the AI system needs lots of examples, and uh, maybe as we learn how the brain sort of encodes all of this fundamental information that's needed for that's needed across the board for visual identification, things I spoke about a moment ago, like how to distinguish shadows and look at the same image from different angles, um, which, as I say, applies widely. Once that information is in place, then an AI system could operate much, 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 much more efficiently. I want to get a little bit into some slightly philosophical terrain about how much knowledge might be innate in the human brain and how that connects to the evolutionary history of the brain, which I know you're interested in. And how does that relate to efforts to design um, algorithms that are trying to learn things quickly, but because they don't have a, an analog of evolutionary history like the human brain does, perhaps that's why it takes so long for them to learn something useful because there, there isn't this kind of experience encoded in the genes over millions of years. There's, it's really from scratch. Um, so maybe you could talk about the efforts to try and give AI some of the innate knowledge or structure that humans seem to be coming online with when they're, you know, coming out of the womb. Right. So. First, we have to really be careful about this term innate knowledge. Uh, and we have to ask the question what we mean by knowledge. I, um, you know, we, we see uh, there's work from um, Elizabeth Spelke that uh, very, very young infants, you know, a few weeks or a few months old, have some sense of uh, gravity because when things uh, drop, they will look down. And they, uh, so they, they, they sort of have that sense um, but I think that knowledge, uh, that, that, that what the brain does, that we are trying, that we are attributing to innate knowledge is actually attributable to a framework of uh, kind of a, a software system, if you'll use that analogy, although that's not a great analogy, but a system, a framework that really is prepped, is all ready to encode knowledge and is waiting for the knowledge to arrive. Now, some of that knowledge arrives in the womb. The, the, uh, the, the brain as it's developing begins to get a sense of, um, of, of nutrients, of hunger. Uh, it gets a sense of timing because it can have some sense of a heartbeat from the mother and from its own heart. Uh, it has some sense of what happens when it moves its uh, muscles spontaneously because, you know, the, uh, um, an embryo, uh, an infant in the womb, especially as you get near term is doing somersaults and all kinds of things. The, uh, so they, uh, all of this motor activity, everything that's going on, uh, is now providing knowledge, uh, to, to a brain. Uh, it probably does not because it's floating in a liquid. It probably, does not at that time have any sense of gravity until it is um, until the delivery happens and it's now in the world and now suddenly there is gravity around it and probably picks up that concept pretty quickly so what um but to summarize all of this my feeling is that the only thing the brain provides is just the framework for capturing knowledge and knowledge is all around us i mean it's coming in all the time um, even in the womb. 
So the brain is well prepared for really dealing with the environment, which is many, many times more complex than the brain. So the brain has to sort of not just capture this information and use it for its survival, but to also judge what's important and what's not. So sort of sort, of sort out the massive amount of information that's coming in and use our senses and our responses and our motor system to now make, um, to, to develop an organism in which the brain is firing its patterns in a way that is useful for the survival of the organism. Hmm. That, Can you tell us that answers all about, of <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, <clears throat> Can you tell us any more interesting tidbits or, or anecdotes or ideas that um, for whatever reason you, you didn't end up including in your story? Oh my, <laughs> the, uh, you mean what got uh, chopped by the editor? <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, yeah I, um, I, think, uh, the, I think the only thing that really, not so much in the way of anecdotes, but I think Perhaps some readers might have wanted some more technical detail. I'm not sure about that. The, uh, the way we, we do this work is actually also, uh, it's a little bit nerdy, but it's quite fascinating in setting up the, uh, um, these arrays, these, these arrays of electrodes, which have 26,000 electrodes on them, on just about two millimeters of real estate. Uh, it's, uh, the engineering involved in this is really just remarkable. Um, and uh, growing the organoids, having them in these incubators and the way watching them grow and, and is also very exciting for us in the lab to look at the cells and to uh, see how they change over time. All of that is um, probably a facet of the engineering and the biology uh, that um, didn't get into the piece completely, a little bit. Is there any desire for you to make the brain organoids that you're using to study this phenomena any bigger? Do you want to scale them up more or are they the perfect size for what you want to do? We would maybe scale them up, but um, so the reason they're small, the main reason they're probably small is because they don't have a vasculature, right? So there's no, there's no blood supply. There's no way for them to get, uh, any kind of nutrients deep into the organoid. They just, it's only what diffuses in from being floating in the media. They also need so that your blood supply delivers oxygen and glucose to the brain. The organoid as it, as it gets larger has a center that is becoming uh, impoverished in terms of oxygen and nutrients. So one step in this field will be the ability to introduce a vasculature into the organoid. Why is it not there already? Well, the reason is, is because embryologically, when we start with stem cells and we make them into neurons, you don't get any blood cells because the blood cells, I'm mean, not the blood cells, the vasculature, the walls, the, the, the walls of the vessels, as well as the blood cells have a very different embryologic origin. So we, the only way we can get a vasculature into the organoid is to take one set of stem cells that we make into neurons and another set that we make into a vasculature and try to meld them together. No one knows how to do that yet. Yeah, that doesn't sound like uh, an easy bioengineering problem. <laughs> it's definitely um, not. Especially when you consider how remarkably the vascular, the vasculature right down to the level of the capillaries penetrates every single tiny portion of our bodies, except for a few areas like the lens in our eyes. But we're, we're just totally uh, permeated with a blood supply down to single red blood cells that go through our capillaries and feed oxygen into every last nook and cranny of the body. Yeah, it's it's 
amazing how small and narrow those passageways are where they're just you're able to send little individual cells just as little right. little packets it's crazy um can you say anything about the impact your story has had what, what sort of response have you seen uh well that's a tough one because uh i um you know I, i've had very some very positive responses uh, but uh i don't really uh necessarily hear the more critical comments <laughs> i would like to though so uh i would be uh continue to be interested in, in feedback uh, directly through Twitter. I'm on Twitter. You know, there's, uh, I posted this on Twitter. There's a lot of different ways in which it would be interesting to uh, interact with people that have opinions, both positive and negative. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of the piece, you talked about the interest your colleagues in the humanities had in your work. Um, did they happen to read this one and, and um, see what your thoughts were on it or They've how, how to, has that collaboration been playing out? Uh, we don't, uh, well, the paper's just out, so I don't, I can't say for sure. I, you know, the, as I say, there's fairly positive feedback. I think it's going to take a lot more discussion. I, I do teach a class on uh, the um, sort of neuroscience of bridge to the humanities. And we have uh, people that are, that have, that are interested in both areas, both, both professors and students. So we, I think I'd like to begin to, to put this piece into the course syllabus, and that will really help to get some more discussion and feedback going. I'd be interested to hear um, what you think is some of the best sort of literary writing about your area of research, about the brain and, and what the brain is doing. Do you, do you have uh, anyone who comes to mind who's especially good? Uh, yeah, well, so I, I think um, we, we have people who write about uh, neurology and neuroscience. Some of them are um, actually neuroscientists and uh, you know, for instance, um, a book that I'm extremely impressed with, uh, and I quoted him in the piece by Yuri Bazaki, uh, has, um, I, I think it has tremendous appeal. It's a deep book. It's called The Brain from the Inside Out. And I think, um, and he writes very, very well and has a strong, he's a real scholar in terms of literature and history and philosophy as well as the science. So those are neuroscientists trying to present their view about the brain and doing it in a, in a way that is kind of popularizing, uh, I would say, um, although some of it gets technical. Then, of course, there are people that are um, just strictly functioning in a, in a, in a purely um, literary domain. And I really think it's, we can learn a lot about um, the pers a lot of that, that well we, there are so many aspects of human nature that we don't understand that that writers can render in a way that a neuroscientist doesn't have a clue about and um, so we already talked a little bit about uh, Samuel Beckett and I think um, that is one example of someone who's thinking about mental function, mental states in a way that a neuroscientist generally does not. And, right. um, but I think what really to me is the power of the power of what literature brings to the question you're posing is that unlike the psychologist who's looking at the, the middle of the bell shaped curve, the way people look at it as an average. The people in literature are looking at the ends of the bell-shaped curve. What are the more extremes of human behavior that we have to grapple with? How can we really understand uh, a lot of what's going in the, on in the world throughout history and today uh, 
if we don't understand the people that are on the margins. And that to me is, I think, where writers tend to focus and neuroscientists really can. What do you, what's an example of something that's on the margins, like um, just really abnormal kind of genius behavior or, or, you know, kind of psychopathic behavior? Well, certainly that's true. That's on, that's on the margin, but I, I think, um, you know, and, and now we're sort of drifting a little bit away from kind of topics that people would think are really even in the domain of neuroscience at all. But, uh, you know, I'll just take another writer that I'm completely enamored with, uh, which is Tony Morrison. You know, how do people deal with the kind of adversity that she writes about? The, the, I don't just mean mm. the kind of prejudice and intolerance that we're you know, sort of necessarily seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm talking about really the severe trauma that you hear that, that she writes about in a book like Beloved. How do we, how do we even begin to think about that kind of uh, oppression that people go through, that people have to tolerate if they can at all, if they, you know, how can mm. people really just um, uh, exhibit behaviors that are just, or that are that extreme, that are that hard to comprehend, that are so difficult to um, understand in the way that we behave with each other when we fail to recognize each other as human beings. I mean, these are not these are not neuroscience questions. These are sociology questions or psychology questions. But the reason they're not neuroscience questions is because they are so far from you know, neuroscience is so far from really understanding the brain that mm -hmm. we can't even begin to approach questions like this, which are really perhaps some of the most compelling questions of our day to, to you know, have to do with human behavior, with aberrant human behavior, with bad behavior. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine <clears throat> how much more would have to be understood about the brain to be able to address questions like that about how, you know, racial bias and, and discrimination can become embedded in, in, in a culture and affect just the collective behavior of, of so many people. Um, I mean, right. no doubt that they're connected, but yeah, this seems just so estranged at this point. They're, they are connected in some way and building that connection prematurely is also dangerous. You know, I mean, people have tried to build connections between behavior and genetics, and that has taken us down many, many wrong, dangerous eugenic paths. Uh, so mm -hmm. science is a dangerous game when we start to apply it to so, uh, sociological questions. Some would say it's a bridge too far, and, it, and at this point it probably is. Um, mm. But it also brings home the, the fact of how little we really understand about the brain. All right, Kenneth, uh, it's been fascinating to, to close out. Do you want to tell our viewers where they can find you online, whether you have a social media account that you post on to let other people um, follow your work? Yeah, well, I'm very easy to find. And just if you search my name, uh, well, everything's there, uh, right? and just a, an easy Google search, but uh, my Twitter handle is Kenneth, and then there's an S. You can see my name on the screen, but if you put an S, my middle initial in between, uh, and a little at sign in front of it, you get my Twitter. And um, there are, you know, there's others too. There's LinkedIn and Facebook, it's Instagram. It's all there, uh, so, and easy to find. I won't bore you with all the handles. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, I'm looking forward to the next piece you write in Nautilus. Great. Well, thank you for, for doing this.
All right. Yeah. Thank you for the time. Bye-bye.